be a body to be a baseline for this. Well, so if anybody else wants to come and join us when we're asked, please just let us know. This is Jeff Crockford of the Biolocation Team and Nigel Hughes. Thank you. Basically, biolocation is the scientific application of the dowsing phenomena. And the dowsing phenomena is basically this business of holding rocks. And when you go through a magnetic field gradient, it sets off a reflex in the muscles and the rocks move. And you think, ah, yes, I found something. That's all I'm going to say because Nigel is going to deal with the science of it and show you that we're now dealing not with a sort of a paranormal phenomena, but with a real physiological sensory uh, phenomena which you can use in a scientific way. So the science of uh, biolocation is based basically on two of the books that we've written, which sets out the, the physics and the sensory side of it and gives you basically the lowdown on the, uh, the science. We were quite happy studying the archaeology of the pre-Roman period. And then Peter Vincent came along and said, oh, I've got a crash site of a uh, UFO. We'll go along and we'll have a look at it and see what it's like. And uh, so he arranged for us to go along and we had a look at this site. Then we analysed it and found it was a uranium response, titanium, volcanic glass, you name it, it was all related to UFO constructions. Polycarbonate. Polycarbonates, yeah, a beryllium. Uh, we had a look at this site, and much to our amazement, we found a genuine crash site of a UFO. All the bits and pieces where the reactor from the craft had dug into the ground, bits of the uh, fabric which had been sprayed over the fields, and we also found uh, where uh, the occupants had tried to get out of the aircraft using ejector seats. So this is the first time that we've come across this and we found the, the body or the chemical remains of the body on the ground and we were trying to work out exactly if it was a body in point of fact, but it came up on phosphate which indicated that it was a body but we couldn't get any response on uh, blood. And then we had the bright idea that perhaps it didn't have blood like us, and the blood might be based on one of the other metals that respiratory pigments are based on. So we actually found that it was based on copper. And from then on, we have tried to categorize the gills, the galactic intelligent life forms, according to the respiratory pigments that they have. The heater hadn't really finished with us at this point, and so once we had sort of done a bit of archaeology, looking at the crash sites, looking at landing sites and so on, he said, well, what about what's up there? He said, why don't you have a look up there? And uh, so we said, well, oh, okay, we'll have a look. It wasn't the first time we realised that we could get uh, magnetic holograms down, because Nigel had already picked that up, uh, tunnels from the roof of this house and he found that these tunnels produced a magnetic anomaly and that anomaly created a hologram as a three-dimensional image, magnetic image, of something which was up there. <coughs> so Peter created this magnetic anomaly and, and so Nigel rushed down and there was the, the ship, the magnetic hologram of the ship, and I rushed over from Bobbington to St Albans and this was the first occasion that we found ourselves walking around the three-dimensional magnetic image of a spaceship and we could literally go along the corridors, we could go through doors, we found the airlocks in the craft and we then started looking at the engines, the actual uh, technology of the craft. We are making progress now. We're not only looking down there at the chemical stains in the ground, but we're looking up there at the magnetic fields which are coming down from above. And so I'm dealing with the introduction, and then Nigel is going to do the main presentation, which is looking at the techniques we use, how we use a basic uh, science of it.
to tell you a bit about our research programs. One of the areas that we might be interested in is the nature of the galactic intelligent life forms, both the sort of technologies that they have, and also a peek at their culture. Just turning around home our techniques and how we do these things, we're going to give you two case studies. And one is going to be the Mendelssohn Forest UFO, and then Nigel's got a film, I think, where he's going to show the work that he and his colleague did on uh, Comet Ison. And then we're going to finish up with a quick review of the things that we might be able to do. I recommend you to you read the last two chapters first, and then start at the beginning to find out how they got there. So we're going to do the same technique today. Now, the first one, this is a stain. We're responding to a painting that was put there by the priests in this temple. So this is the part of the floor of a Druidic temple. And Druidic temples are divided into four quarters, and each quarter has a picture in it, or an idol of some sort. And it's the picture of what we call a key gilt. And this was the guy whose bodies we found in our first uh, crash site. So when they painted it, they put the red ochre there, for it. they put uh, some woad there, um, some lime there, and so on. We can identify those. This is the benefit of it, of the work we do. It's forensic science. So we're using forensic science to identify the chemicals that are now in the ground. They were three foot, three foot down in the ground. But they're there still, and we can pick up their magnetic signature. This is his head, and the pigios, we always find that they're wearing a helmet. We haven't worked out why, because they are aerobic, they breathe uh, oxygen. He's got two staffs, and the staffs are actually colored, and above him is a black area with the stars. And this is over in Ireland, and the constellation is in fact the cloud. This is a close-up of the head. This looks very much like sort of goggles, but we don't think it is. We think it is a feature of the person himself, and he's a button down his tunic, and they do have insignia denoting rank, very often on their shoulders and on their arms as well. This is Nigel's rendition of it, and this is, uh, these are the colours that we're actually picking up. And we think that the peculiar nature of the clothing and its design is to enable them to fly in a zero gravity field. Now we're moving on to an s -gilf. These are the carnivores, by the way. The previous ones were not, they were more vegetarians. And this is taken from the floor of a temple, an Eskil temple. And it's more difficult to see. These are the uh, legs spread out there. He's got his arms on either side here. And then uh, I think uh, this is probably the head with a headdress around it. So what we've got here is something which is deliberately painted on the floor of a temple to presumably look like a saint or a god or something like that. And also we know that these guys were making sacrifices. So we're beginning to pick up a bit of their culture. Now, when I was down in Tenerife this year, they've got some pyramids in Tenerife. And along one of the main pyramids, there's a walkway Fortunately, if you put something on top of stains, it protects the stains. Uh, it doesn't interfere as it would do with ordinary archaeology. For us, a lot of those stuff on top, it preserves them. And so I was able to get a very good picture of what we believe is in fact the face, the archimatic face, remember this is painted by a priest or something like that, of what we call an eagle. And we believe that these may be his ears here, his headdress, he's got a star pattern above his head, and there are four of these panels. They contain writing. So we've actually got the, or could get, the laborious process 
uh, we could get the writing of the eight gifts if we wanted. One of the things that we can do is call down the images of various things that are in space. And one of the things we call down, of course, are some of their ships. It so happens that the magnetic lens, if you like, holds the image still. So although it may be moving and the Earth is rotating, that image remains steady. And so that gives us an opportunity to look at things which are painted on the hull of the ship. It's telling you who the ship belongs to and uh, who is inside. It's a planet with a blue sea with green uh, lands or continents. And we believe that this is indicating that the P and S kilts are allies because this belongs to an Eskilf ship and the ship from stem to stern was about a mile long. We were able to estimate the size so finally we've got something to compare it with. And this is a Eagle ship and you'll notice that their sea is red and there must be a reason for that. Fresh water on their continents is in fact blue. And again, they've got a pattern of stars. And interestingly, they do distinguish between the different colors of the stars. So you've got the white, the red, and the blue uh, stars there. And again, this is on the hull of one of their uh, big ships. And this is how we're getting it out. So this is plotting it all out, the Boris process, and then that is converted into diagrams that you just uh, see. Now that is not responding to a stain coming up from the ground, it's responding, the downs are responding to a field that's coming down from above. Now we look at the insignia on all the craft, it's actually one on a uh, fighter. So we're able to get these off the wings of the, uh, the fighters. Probably the first number we ever did, and I think this one looks the best. And again, I think it's telling us that you've got the PNS skills, your allies, and that would probably be on all their fighters. Now, this is a wee bit different to the other ones. This is from a painting in the ground. So, this is an archaeological one, and any of you with the necessary skills can go along there and actually get this one out without any uh, difficulty. And this is to give you an idea of the sort of fighters that they have, they are built to operate within uh, space and in a planetary atmosphere. And so you find that they've got ceramic nose cones, which is shown diagrammatically here as a triangle, but the ceramics are on the leading edges of the uh, wings and the tails, and it is a fighter, these are neon uh, cannons, those polycarbonate uh, windows reactor is back there and then they have normally maser, what we call maser engine, which I'm like. but interestingly, because it's coming down into the atmosphere, it also has air breathing engines. And so the green is indicating the petroleum fuel paraffin or whatever it is for the air breathing engines. And you see here on the NASCAR, the NASCARs are the anaerobic life forms. So that's the sort of thing that we're getting. My job then is to uh, tell you a little bit about how we get these amazing diagrams from uh, our actual dowsing. Because we've got quite a claim. Unlike a lot of different ufology, we have got a lot of technical information on what we are observing. Um, and we have the basic principles of the technology. It's quite a claim. But we wouldn't make that claim unless we're confident that we can take people out and show them how to do this and find the same things. As scientists, generalized scientists, uh, one of the things you must be able to do in any scientific work, of course, is to meet and transfer your work to, to other people. And the results must be reliable in that they find more or less the same you find. There will be anomalies and things like that. So it's quite a claim, and as the presentation moves on, there will be more things. So, what I thought I'd do with my little talk is, as well as explaining a little bit about our techniques and the science behind it, it's been going on for 20 years, it's through quite a study. 
we feel this is sort of a key key to ET. And it's quite random because the techniques we can use may be able to tell if someone's been abducted. Because if you're taken into space, you will pick up what we call space chemicals. Uh, one of those is carbon-14. Carbon-14 is made in space, it drops down onto the Earth, gets assimilated into the uh, plants and the biology of the Earth, and that allows us then to radiocarbon date things. Of course, up in space, if you're in an atmosphere, it'll be carbon-14 rich. That's, that's our hypothesis. So uh, we feel that it's uh, something that we can develop as, as an hypothesis. It's work in progress, it's early days, but very encouraging results. We'll talk more about that later. First of all, a big thank you to Joanne, who's been welcome us to present today. This is the first public airing of our work. For years we've been running courses, you know, sort of quite scientific. So there's an open invitation really for many of us. We're, we're totally accessible. Uh, we will take you out. We can come on and us on any field uh, trips that we do. Uh, I'd just like to make a statement, uh, follow up what Jeff has shown you, because it's quite plain. Um, we've been studying this now, uh, for a little to remind me of myself, since July 2011, which the scientists are trying to be sceptical as part of the critical thinking. You know, I have to be critical, and you've got to sort of uh, not take it personally. You have to challenge everything I'm doing. But my image there is of lots of ships, and we came up with this name, Cosmic Ocean. I haven't spoken it off Carl Sagan, because I know he used that comment. But that's what it is from our perspective. It's teeming up there with life, absolutely life. It is prevalent right through uh, the solar system and beyond. And one of the features we regularly observe are huge fleets uh, flying around the place, and they also come around Earth. What exactly is going on, we're still trying to sort out. Quite a claim. And uh, rather than ET, we call them galactic intelligent life forms. And where we got that to from is in one of our books when we were postulating about what life form if life could get going in space, what that life form would actually take, uh, what path it would take, and how it would develop. But of course, there are a couple of big things you've got to overcome about you know, being a spacefarer. And obviously, as you speed of your travel, you've got to be able to travel quick, because we know the speed of light, if that's the speed limit out there, you can't get anywhere very quickly at all. And the other thing is your transmission. Radio waves are not up to the job. You cannot uh, communicate by radio waves effectively in space. When they, when they landed on the moon, there was a transmission delay of three more seconds, I believe, to get back to Earth. I think when they go to Mars, that's going to be about 20 minutes. You go out further and further, you can't work in real time. They can. And we put forward our hypothesis and our observations and some demonstrations of the principles of that. So uh, July uh, 2011 was a significant month when we uh, did that sort of experiment. It really changed my view of the world, my view of the solar system. I suppose we'll say something I like on the TV, if you don't want to know the result, leave now. Because it, it is a little bit sort of shattering for us what we found and we'll present the evidence to you why that is. I mentioned the biolocation team. Uh, together everyone achieves more access to different sorts of dowsing. But one of the things we try and do is hold it together on a scientific basis. And the principle is really quite simple. It's what we're doing, we're responding to magnetic fields from chemicals, i.e. atoms and uh, molecules. Our sense is quite a sophisticated magnetometer. And this is, enables it to be a very powerful analytical tool. But uh, when we first met with uh, Joanne, uh, and we've done the course, uh, I suddenly uh, realized we had a lot in common with Amash. Certainly, when our interface with ET isn't abduction or anything like this, but we are sort of studying them every day, and it's quite a profound experience, particularly the scale of what we think is going on. It's uh, our dowsing, dowsing is dowsing, it's invisible stuff at the moment. So, again, it's beyond our normal senses. Uh, I don't know much about um, abduction, to be honest, and in fact, I didn't really know much about UFOs because you know, I was a dowser. I was in pipes and stains in the ground until July 2011 when we were introduced to, to this phenomenon. There's a lot of, lot of motivation needed to actually sort this out. There's got to be some sort of service to investigate and support uh, the phenomenon. So we're always on the phone to each other all the time. I'll just mention very quickly about my own background. In 23 years, I was, I was a pilot and I retired from that, uh, but I was trained as a scientist. 
in very various uh, SL jobs in science, and also work in education and lecturing and, and things like that. I flew for 23 years, I never saw a UFO. Uh, I came out of flying and I moved on into other areas, uh, management training, and did all sorts of work. And then I met Jeff. Uh, I'd done a bit of doubt, he never really understood what was going on. I knew I had doubt. And then I met Jeff, adopted the methodology, and um, that's 20 years ago. Ever since we've been sort of at it uh, every day trying to sort out the theory, sort out the techniques. You know, I think that the point uh, that I want to make there is that I am a physical dowser, I'm not, I'm not a uh, spiritual dowser, or an intuitive dowser, or a dimensional dowser. I am just using my responses, as you see in a minute, as a reflex action to magnetic fields, and I'll try and just demonstrate some of the evidence for that. Uh, I think we can look at abduction is because any abduction process will leave a chemical trace. And I'll, I'll show you all the chemical traces up here in the The forensic will be with the dams. The other thing that will be left will be this business about magnetic holograms. We'll call them a magnetic engine. Because this is another aspect of the energy we do. It's paramagnetic and diamagnetic energy. It can actually leave uh, a magnetic entity which contains a lot of detail uh, about the object that's created it. And, and that's how we can then, and I'll be showing you that. Um, it is all about science from my perspective. Uh, some of the things there, scientific inquiry we should know about, baseline controls, designing experiments using models and theories, testing and validation, reliability and repeatability. We build a lot of that into our methodology and of course critical thinking skills. You know, we must evaluate what we do and the quality, how correct, have we made a mistake. Uh, we've got uh, to be ready to change our mind. Uh, uh, this is our theory about spinning electrons, which creates the energy. And without moving from the chemistry lesson, there is a theory and it meets the observations and it ties in with the fact that chemicals, atoms and molecules, or the atoms, uh, have paired electrons around the nucleus, single electrons, and this is what gives us uh, the energy that we actually dose. And it is a sense that there are other senses, so if we touch something hot, transmission will go up into the spinal cord, go straight back out, and we'll move your hand away. This leads on to what can we look for in a potential abduction case. So I mentioned contamination in the body, carbon-4, in particular iridium. That's a space chemical you find they use a lot. Implants inside the body, environmental contamination, is this phenomenon called quantum tunneling, which I'll talk about shortly. And these holograms or magnetic entities associated with the dynamics of the abduction. Right, so let's do some demonstrations. I'll show you a very simple demonstration here. First, we've got to teach you to respond, and we do that in a number of ways. But very quickly, if you walk into that crystal, the walls across. If you walk back, they'll go home. I can walk into there, go back, take a little step, walk in, and it looks like I'm following a line. And if I come around the back, I get a very interesting effect. It turns my rods. So one of the first things we teach is to get people responding and getting this response really sharp and precise. A couple of other things about leaving, again, this is the scientific inquiry. We change things, we explore things systematically. So if I walk briskly through and I walk at the end of the stage, I will uh, get a really sharp, swift response. I'm going to just do it that way so you can see me. So I can go through there and my rocks will be. So when you see the things we've marked out there, what we're actually doing, instead of an energy field that way, it's coming out of the ground. That way, it's a line. And so when I walk over that crystal, I get a really nice response. So this is all going along, absolutely, John. But if I come in and did an angle, I don't see it. I come in this way, I don't actually see it. If I put it up like this, then, and I walk towards it, I get a response there. If I come here, I don't get a response. But if I just tune in, I get a response. And 
then if I turn it again, I look like a form of circle of energy all the way around. If I want to know where that crystal is, because of the gradient and the energy coming off it, I turn around, and as soon as I'm on max gradient to the crystal, I get the response. So the sensors are in the skin. This is a paramagnetic field. The sensors are in the skin. Again, we've identified the areas of the skin that are sensitive to it by popping up the car. And this energy is quite easily blocked. It's not like ferromagnetism. I put a piece of card in there, it'll block it for about 10 minutes, and then that goes up. So we've got a lot to show people about this scientific inquiry, looking for patterns, looking for shapes. But the uptake of this is that your responses follow a pattern that's like a magnetic field. Uh, and you can further develop that, look at the properties of the, the shapes and what, what happens. And it's very clear that the evidence then that this is a real physical energy entity around there. So we're ending up with this three-dimensional entity. This is on the crystal. Uh, there are other entities that have other shapes, which we will hopefully go through. Just want to show you, why do the rods move? No energy around the rods. The rods do, again, find people's responses improve when they understand what's going on. Power tubes are the arms. When you rotate your arms, like this, you can't rotate your hands independently of your arms. They have to rotate, and the rotation comes from the joint, a couple of muscles there, coordination, sublimation, and you rotate the arms. And what's happening is that you can video this, you can film it, you can put large doweling rods on your arms, and you can see them moving. So all that happens is that when you walk into this energy, your magnetic sensors in your skin hit the energy, uh, there's a reflex action. It's a muscle twitch. It's a very you won't see your arms moving unless. And as they rotate in, they'll cross, and then they'll go back out by rotating out, and they rotate the other way again. We've actually got models to support the dowsing, and it really does help. We met, um, I think, when Jeff was started, uh, and he, he started to learn the dows because he was working on detrimental energies for. Uh, equipment and dowsers only seem to be the only ones who can detect that. But on our courses, generally, by about lunchtime, most people are really responding, you know, really well. I just responded as energy everywhere because everything is paramagnetic or diamagnetic or both. So it's a complex world, this energy world. It overlaps, sometimes it interferes, interacts, behaves in a particular way, it can be messed up by space weather. So the whole thing, the evidence for it, is very powerful and the dowser is really working. People look at every day, in every day life don't realise it, but the dowser realises he's working, he or she is working in a sea, an ocean of energy. This is a bottle of water. How many people say it's crystal the water? The water's a liquid crystal. That should be there. So I get the signals. I just start walking there. That's the response. I walk around the back. That's the response. I put the bottle up right. Slightly not as far up, but I get the aura of the bottle. Now, the difference is to the crystal, of course, is that water in the solution will like a bottle of water. The tissue fluids in our uh, bodies will contain dissolved substances and plus other substances from the uh, blood vessels and muscles and things like that. So if our water contains any chemicals, we'll be able to dump it. Because the chemicals in there will also create an aura. So we'll just demonstrate that. And the chemical in it, we'll check out the chemicals, yeah? I want to show you a nice little phenomenon now. I want to introduce now another aspect of the dowsing and how we can analyse chemicals in this water. And uh, it's what's called a witness. We also have another system which people instantly develop, is to use it what we call colds. And we'll just briefly have a look at that. It's, it's quite a complex thing, but just to show you how you can do this. In that bottle there, I've got a chemical. If I just get a piece of metal, 
plastic bottle, stage manager in the early, right? If I just do that, enough plastic has come off that now, plastic cap thickness, and I come on there, takes a few minutes, all the atoms that have come off the plastic, the molecules, have all gone into the crevices on the stage, generated this field, the field is linked up, and we can double it. So that's what we got from the diagram. But, uh, uh, ten years ago, I pulled a bottle of red wine in the corner of the field, my research field, and I'm still dousing it today as if I pulled it, you know, there and then on the spot. Because once it gets into the material, you can't get it. If I scrub that stage, it would still be there. Because the atoms and the molecules get into all these cracks and crevices. So, the protection. We know what clothing they wear, we know how they operate. If there's a physical presence, they will be the same. And from, from what we wear in the space clothing and other processes, we know the trace of chemicals. <coughs> what can happen with these stains? You can either have an halo, where just stuff is just, you know, you sit down in your biscuit, your cake, your crumbs go everywhere. Or they can be laid down very geometrically. So if you had a wall or building on the ground, this is the archaeology we were working, we could tell us a stain of the ground with us, and we were witnessing everything is in there from the post holes to where the dog slept, from the dog hair, because it goes down into the ground over time and it impregnates in the soft aquifers. We did a lot of work with the castle in our first book, because the giants, it's not a castle, the Romans attacked it, all the blood. It's down here where the Roman army came out and it does the battle in great detail because we know what the Roman soldiers ate. The temple, the dikes are ceremonial. This isn't a fortification, it may have been used. Um, and I think there's about 1,000 Wikipedia says or 1,300 hill forts. So, guess what? In view of what we're finding out, something strange about hill forts. First of all, was, uh, some of them said to me they look like bindings on a solenoid. From our work that we've been doing on the gills, Paul in particular has been sort of very active in the day going out to these sites, and we're identifying it all runs. Because these dikes are everywhere, they're all over the country. They just happen to be around the hill sometimes. There's the Wands Dike just down the way from uh, Bristol, it runs for miles across. St. Albans has got dikes, ditches, all the way back. Of course, we went down in there and we found them full of nectar, called ET chemicals. And the evidence is building. These Cambridge University study, these were, they reckon out their new radiocarbon dating techniques that were built in 75 years. You just can't do that with what was around at the time, what we understand. Uh, and I have a flight pass one. I used to be a pilot. And I, when we were doing a lot of work on the druids, I spent a lot of time flying around these earthworks. So we knew them, knew quite a lot about them. Not great quality, but I was trying to fly and take a shot. This is Beacon Hill, I think, down by Borders um, Memory. There's the so called hill fort on the top. And everyone you fly over, after a while you start to think, there were forts very often poor defensive, but not a tiny investment to keep them if they were going to be defensive. Very good, nice shot. But they have been used. So I think uh, this was in the Bronx I think Jack was in the cage, put me down and we were when were they built the Cambridge study? Oh, the late 6,700 years ago. This is quantum tunnel. I could do a demonstration of this. This is the laser engine. The gills can travel faster than the speed of light. We know that. This is a principle of the laser engine. It's got a little power supply at the back, battery. There's a magnetic collar. They use iridium for their magnetic collars, like using something else. It creates a standing wave system in years ammonia. If I charge this up, the ammonia 
a beam will go right across there, through the wall, out the building, through the next building, and keep going, closely followed by the ammonia particles. If I pointed at anything, it would become stained with ammonia. And ammonia is very volatile. So urine, for example, uh, fresh urine on the ground, the urea can rapidly change to ammonia. After five or ten minutes, you can't tell it's ammonia. Tunnel, it's still the ammonia is still actually the And they use ammonia as a fuel when they laser engines, as Jeff mentioned. And it's a very simple equation as I see it, E equals MC squared. Energy is mass times speed of light squared. Those particles could be coming out of there close or fast to the speed of light. So we're trying to work the technology. We need a lot of iridium. They use a lot of iridium in this engine. And a piece of meter wire, about a quarter of a millimeter thick, is 800 pounds. So that's why I say about the iridium as a choice of the chemicals. So it's a dosable effect, but nevertheless, they are using a natural process. They haven't gone the way of the electric wave. They've gone the way of the magnetic wave. It's got enormous power. It's not physical power. It's a power of the molecules to do things. And that is called the quantum tunnel. And that is another way we feel you might be able to get a conduction. Because the equipment they wear and how they come down, they, the place will be quantum tunnel, be riddled with quantum tunnel material. But that's just to give you an insight. There we are, so the station plans. Then coming out of this engine, Jeff will talk about this on the Rendlesham, there'll be particles coming out on the quantum tube, that's what the amazing engine is essentially. When it hits the ground, we'll just keep going through it. The technology is that they have tapped, if you like, the energy of the universe. They've got mastery of their fission and atomic reactors, and they've got mastery of cold fusion and hot fusion. And they know how to collect the debris of space, if you like, as they actually throw it. They have also managed to work out how to take the M out of E equals MC squared. And as soon as you remove mass from that equation, you're no longer tied to the speed of light. They have no difficulty now in moving at speeds considerably greater than the uh, speed of light. And using that sort of technique, they would be able to adapt people and do the road at quite considerable distances in very short periods of time. It's probably that bit of information when we got hold of it that made us start taking abduction uh, seriously. We now know how they might in fact uh, do it. The culture is, as far as we know at the moment, not terribly advanced. They have temples, they have sacrifices, uh, they have a ceremonies, so the head who picked up their uh, radar, we know how they uh, go about burying uh, people, and we have a suspicion that quite a lot of our culture actually does come from the hills when they're actually on planet Earth going through their sort of religious uh, ceremonies. The one thing that might indicate that they do have an advanced culture is that for some reason they have left the Earth alone since about 6,000 to 7,000 years ago. There's no evidence that we have at the moment that they came back and in any way interfered with the Earth from that period on. And when they left, and this was after a few hundred years, we think, of warfare, We've got their battlegrounds, we've got their gun emplacements, we've got the areas where they were repairing their ships, their uh, manufacturing systems and so on. They cleared up, as far as we can see, every nut and bolt on the planet. We haven't been able to find any. All we get is their civil engineering and the chemical stains of their railways, of the engine exhausts, of the wheels of their vehicles, 
and so on. We get the chemical stains that they're left behind, but we do not get, as I say, even a nut or a bolt or a sleeper from their uh, railways at, at the, uh, the moment. And that <coughs> makes us think that they must have something like a Geneva Convention, where they say, right, there's a intelligent species there, it's going to develop, and from now on, we leave it alone. And everything they do, they cloak themselves, it's impossible for us to normally see them by normal means, we see them magnetically, of course, that's how we pick, pick them up, but visually, they are very effectively cloaked. And um, in the early days, I would write to um, Seth, uh, Seth in the United States, and said, oh, well, there's a very great big coming in, you must be able to see it. And I got no response at all, they couldn't see anything. And it was when we suddenly began to think, well, perhaps, perhaps he's right, perhaps he can't see it, that we began to cotton on to the fact that these things were visually cloaked. And once we got onto that, we were able to work out uh, how they were cloaked. The device would pick up magnetically the device. We don't know how it works. And we realized that they were uh, visually uh, cloaked. How do we find out if they're here or not? And why haven't other people found them? And, you know, why don't we dump them into the world? They don't the fact that these guys are here. And I think the the reason is that they probably haven't really looked and nobody sat down to actually think out how you would identify if they're here and plan how to do that. Now, in one sense, I had to do it when I went to New Zealand because I went there to find out if those people, if the guys were there. But you, you walk into the sort of central park, out of the park there, and you very quickly recognize that it's got guilt characteristics. And you can pick up their railways and tracks and the fact that at one time there was a big building, in fact a temple, your temple on the hilltop in the, uh, in the park there. So from an archeological point of view, is there civil engineering? You can pick up the carbon 14 from their reactors and we've been waiting a long time to do that and we now have a sample from under one of their reactors which is high on carbon 14 and all we're going to do now is to find the laboratory that might have a little bit to find out if they can confirm that we've got uh, carbon 14 in it. Now the carbon 14 comes from the neutrons in the reactor. You've got uh, war grave cemeteries, battlefields, Near where I live, out in the fields, you've got the gun emplacements. People refer to them as tunnels, and you've got patches of the tunnels, but they're actually uh, gun emplacements. You've got there, um, basically, the cursors, um, which are used for aircraft uh, landing and taking off. So you've got the remains of their battlefields. Now, the other thing is atmospheric chemistry. and. With the activity that's been going on, particularly over the past two or three years, there's been quite a big change in the upper atmosphere in terms of the chemistry. And I'd be very surprised if they don't know that there are changes in the chemical chemicals up in the upper atmosphere. Again, I would be surprised if there aren't elevated levels, particularly of carbon 14, in the ice cores around about that uh, period of time. Astronomy. Here, they're hamstrung because they don't use magnetics, they use optical methods. Then we come to the ancient records and mythologies, and if you want to um, go straight for Ezekiel, the Ezekiel issue, I think there's four occasions when he's in contact with these uh, people. And it's rather interesting because it is a very exact description. Once you, once we read it, I read it. Hey, you know perfectly well that it is not made up. It's actually a report of what we saw and what happened. It's not, it's not a figment of his imagination. And that's rather interesting, because Ezekiel is about 500 something BC, I forgot what it is. 
and the description it gives does not actually fit the technology that we know. It seems to be a different technology. And so we're wondering whether another group sort of looked in uh, about two and a half thousand years ago. So you put the ancient records in the country, and then you've got the uh, Euclid sightings and abductions. I think in terms of looking at abductions, the suggestion that we're making is there are possibly four different scenarios which could lead to somebody feeling that they have been abducted. The important one is number three, because that is the technique that we use for looking at them. We can get them down, we can get them into this room, their machine, and the people concerned, we can actually get their magnetic holograms down there and look at them. And not only that, we've had sensitives, is that they normally pick up the aliens, the people, but they don't pick up the machinery. We pick it up, and of course we have but the sensitives don't seem to be able to pick up the engine suit. So they pick up the aliens, and they know which is head and which is tail. Is so the sensitives are quite good at uh, picking up uh, these uh, people. And then the, the physical abduction, I think we could handle as a real sort of site uh, investigation, forensics, and crime scene investigation. Right, so with that note, I'll finish. I'm going to go on the earth, the, the roof supports in the roof, access to the land, and we get holograms in the house and in the garden. They're there. And you can go to the organization. The people we call the sensitives will know that they're there and they'll describe it to you. And so we tend to use them. And uh, now that Peter's gone, I can say, well, he's a sensitive and we use him a hell of a lot. On our website, uh, the photo, now the second one is due shortly. There we all are on the site. This is where we are standing in the crew positions. That's one of the engine imprints. It's as clear as anything, it's as clear as it, and the hologram. That was the outline of the crew. The boys went back and they managed to get more detail out of the craft. That's what the craft sort of looked like. Procedure and results. Once on site, the procedure was for the team to look for the craft's major features, such as the titanium footprints in the landing gear, the titanium outline of the hull, and the imprint of the engine exhaust. Later, magnetic cables made from polyamide and graphene were looked for and also neon laser guns. If the vehicle had remained on the ground for a number of hours, it was possible the chemicals quantum tunneled into the ground had produced a sort of photographic image. This was in fact found to be the case and the team was able to work out an outline of the craft, the ship, where the Forestry Commission notice board said it had been along with its engine exhaust. Since the planetary excursion vehicle, PEV, landed, many trees have grown up in the area and this made it difficult to follow the outline of the craft and its structure in detail. The diagram of the vehicle is therefore not precise. At first, it looked as if the PEV had a single engine, but as it was offset to one side, this did not make sense. A second engine was then found, but its imprint on the ground was much smaller. When the exhaust stains were studied, the main imprint consisted of ammonia, nitrate and copper. This is the imprint of a P. Gilf engine. The second imprint only had ammonia. It looked very much as if the PEV had engine failure and had landed on one engine. This left an exhaust imprint offset from the center of the vehicle. During the survey, a magnetic cable was found coming in from outside the craft and going to the faulty engine. The cable was followed back to the landing site of a second PEV and about 40 meters away. With the magnetic cable, there was a titanium cable. 
The conjecture is that the vehicle was a rescue vehicle which provided fuel or power to the faulty engine and perhaps towed the crippled craft away. The crippled craft was on the ground for possibly a number of hours from about 2 a.m. During this time, sufficient chemical was left in the ground due to abrasion and quantum tunneling for a detailed picture of the craft to be created. The iridium rings of the engines could be identified. At least two craft were involved. If a craft had landed due to engine failure, then it may be that it took until the following evening to get a rescue vehicle to it, or it was waiting for cover of darkness. A companion craft may have been present in the early hours of the 27th December, 1980 and it is possible that this is the craft that was seen by the patrol to rapidly take off. So this is the one thing about stains you mustn't dig. You can dig the stains out and find what level they are. If you disrupt the ground, they're very delicate gossamer-like molecules. You lose the sort of all the videos. The Colin Dyson and Kay Jordan emailed me and said, what's going on with Dyson? I went out, uh, found it on the astroscope, uh, Jeff got it down in the garden, enormous detail hologram of it, crawling with FPT activity, there were mines on it, but they not only flew it around the sun, they were on it going around the sun, their technology can deflect the sun's energy off it. When they got around the other side, stripped all the ice off it, they then hollowed it out, turned it into some huge spaceship station, put four engines on, and left the solar system, it got across was it 50 astronomical units in about 40 minutes? And its acceleration would have meant, certainly as going into the stellar space, it would be well past light speed. You know, there's a video on that, by location. So I'll douse some people now. It's quite a claim to make it. It's accessible. We will show anyone how you know you decide for yourself. Joanne, you can be our test. Joanne is our control. We've done a lot of work with Adam and Joanne, uh, developing this technique. Adam and Joanne have done the course, done the techniques. So Joanne, you can come here. I'll just do a check for human blood. So you've got a nice blood in grass. I'll take a carbon 14 with this. And in Iridium, we need this code, we have cross-reference to actual material. Or so this is for abduction now, this is checking me for to see if I'm an abductee, so for trace elements. So, I've got nothing on Iridium, and I've got nothing on Calum 14. Okay. So I'm going to do a control. Incidentally, you know the witnesses in your mouth, you're, you're, you're desensitizing the middle of your body. You can't have them respond to the end. Finish that. And I'm going to do Iridium on Adam. Alright, get the response. I'm now going to do Carbon 14. And there's a good Carbon 14 response. Now we've got to be careful here just to finish. We have to be scientists, we have to check samples, 
this doesn't happen. Everyone I've looked at, there's something going on with Adam's aura. It may not be infection, it may be another effect, but we, we've got we've done a few other people as well, and it is looking quite encouraging that we may be at that point. We've got to be careful what we say. Anyway, uh, that, that's where we are with it, and we want people to come on board and help. Can we just test these two folks yeah, here? Sure. Um, I suspected that Adam was an abductee for various okay. reasons no, I won't go into. And, um, and I really didn't feel that I was, although I have great empathy for the field, of course. It turned out to be correct from the dowsing by the patient perspective. So that's a positive on the brief. Dowsing on the medium, and as I said, we still oh. have a few developments. Right, I'm going to check your titanium then. Yeah, the titanium over there, and if you've got something in there, there should be a team coming out on the field lines. Yeah. So, you know, at this stage, that's really positive. I think this is really important because there are so few ways for us to test this, and this is in its infancy in this field, but I would really ask anybody who's interested to try for themselves to develop yeah. their own groups linked with the national by location and please feed back results. We're trying to develop a body of information yeah. and data and as you can see, you've just seen something here, we're going to have a look at um, this young man from yeah. Staff at FM, I felt all the staff on the That's good. Let's go. <laughs> uh, I would say from the scientific group, we get all our other team to check this, we do it blind. And we are not in, I, I would do this, so we would not be public with this, we'd have to do surgery if you like, because we have to control the magnetic environment. These fields can fool you and they can get distracted. But we've done a few people today, there's a clear difference in their auras, that is to look for other evidence. Uh, there are other trace chemicals and other things that you can actually see. Clearly, I know trying to contact us. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Aliens, UFOs, mm -hmm. people getting abducted. So it's all. It all sort of overlaps, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. all about the laps. Yeah. Dowsing is it's an ancient skill, mainly used for finding water, but mm. can be used for finding anything, basically. We've done some research and we've pinned it down to um, magnetic fields, which mm. all objects give off. And uh, these fields can be identified. If you hold a sample in your hand, what you're looking for, say you're looking for a gold, for instance, you hold a bit of gold, you get a reaction. Uh, we call that a witness. Now, the coding system, these colour codes, it's another way of having a witness without actually having the actual object. And, and Peter does all this by asking questions in his head. Basically gets all this out of his head. I can't do this. His grandfather, he was a very good dowser. And... Um, he had a thing called a, what he called a computer. This is back in the First World War. It, when Peter looks into it, it all comes down to the colours related to numbers, related to substances. Because if Peter gives me one of those barcodes, uh, I go looking for something, and if it's there, I get a reaction. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that code gives a reaction. Peter may do, but I don't. But it works. It's a tool, basically, a tool for finding things. You can discover things that have happened thousands of years ago because whatever's happened, it's like forensics, whatever happens, it seeps it leaves into the ground, a, it leaves a stain, mm. chemical stain. It's only a minute trace, but that's enough. Even the slightest trace is going to have a few atoms of what is amazingly sensitive. You don't have to have any special abilities or anything like that. Everybody can do this mm. with a bit of practice. It's not paranormal, it's, it's just another sense we've all got and we don't use. Well, certain people don't want this in, don't want it looked at, don't want the public to know. Um, they're high up people, you know, and they don't like gousers either because we find out things they don't want us to know. <laughs> Thanks a lot for that. The mind That's has a store of knowledge and it seems to be stored in colour. So we have para, both sides, dire in the centre, and ferra through the skin. So when you hold a colour coat like this, and you hold it in your hand, you should get a response. If you hold a pair of rods which are magnetic sensors against an equal object, 
let's say something, I put something on the floor. So I'm going to put this piece of human remains, which is stonified through age. The rods do not cross. The reason is that this has got silver in it. Silver donates the female. So if I pick up the male code, which has no silver in it, so all the other colours are the same, we will then hold him there and the rods just want to be crip across. Right, so that's male, ancient male burial in excess of 6,000 years old. This is a cast of something that could be even older. It could be as old as 20 million years, but definitely older than 6,000 years. The reason for it's very difficult to gauge the age of something, except that it takes volcanic activity and pressure to create this. Um, therefore, it must be a lot older than 6,000 years. Mm. So we're edging on the end. So we're now going to use this code here and there's no response to the human. Mm. Pick up this code here, which is uh, green, silver, grey, blue, red, orange and yellow. They all add up to 41. 41 is the siren code, the mythological siren. So we hold this and the draw is quite considerable. It also works on photographs. Because here's a photograph, and that photograph's caught that image. We haven't done this before, so let's have a little look. So is this the first time you've done yes, it? Yes. It's exciting. Cutting edge. <laughs> it's positive. Uh, Absolutely positive. Yeah. In your hand, and you need to read these colours fairly loosely, like this, about that far yeah. apart, and you hold the code in your hand, having read the things like that. And then you mark, and you should seal the draw of the rods together. In, into your hand, hold them vertically, progress over the object. Oh, I do feel something actually. It, it does, yes. I felt something. Yeah, you will. There you are, yeah. Yeah, 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 quite. Then, uh, nothing. Nothing so. Right, because that isn't what that's, that colour is. That's amazing. So that's the biometric language of colour. That's wow. I'm uh, Jeff Crockford. I started life in a sense in a university department as an occupational hygienist. And about 20, 25 years ago, people started complaining about headaches and various subjective symptoms when they were working with visual display units and other electrical equipment. As an occupational hygienist, my job was to go along and try and find out what it was that was worrying them and causing discomfort. And with many other people, I found that we could not, in fact, identify what the problem was. And we found that the only people who could do anything were, in fact, dowsers who appeared to be able to go along and respond to things that were coming from visual display units, from television screens and so on. And then they would also control and they'd put these rather nice quartz crystals on top of the VDUs and then the operative would feel much happier. Now this was not a satisfactory situation from the point of view of a scientist and occupational hygienist. So I decided that I had to learn how to douse so that I could actually see what they were seeing. And so I went off and uh, spent a weekend learning how to douse. And in point of fact, it's one of the best educational experiences that I've ever had. I went unable to douse and actually came back able to douse. I came back to this house here in point of fact Within minutes of arriving back home, I was out in the garden, I was down the lane, I was busily dowsing all the things that are around. Anyhow, as a scientist, it's one thing being able to demonstrate that people are responding to something. You've got to be able to find out what that something is, and you've got to be able to control it, at least eventually. And so my first step was to investigate the phenomena of dowsing, and try and put it onto a scientific basis. And that was the first challenge and quite an important step. And I then spent probably something like two years gradually working out what it was. 
and it came to fruition in a sense when I managed to produce what is now called the diamagnetic and paramagnetic theory of biolocation. And uh, you'll notice that I refer to two forms of magnetism. And I don't refer to ferromagnetism, which is the one that most people are familiar with. They get their magnets and they stick them on their fridges and things like that. The dowser does not respond to that form of magnetism. They only respond to what is called paramagnetism and diamagnetism. Two forms of Faraday, in fact, uh, discovered when he was working on uh, magnetism. Now, having discovered the physical agent, the next important step was to identify the sentry system in the body that responded uh, to them. And I found that the sentry system for the diamagnetic field was actually in the head. You shine a beam of diamagnetic magnetism at the body and there's no response. But if the head goes through it, then you get the typical dowsing response with the change in muscle tone. Similarly, with the paramagnetic field, if you shine a beam of paramagnetic magnetism at the head, there's no response. But if it hits the body, then you get the typical dowsing response again. And the two are easy to demonstrate because if you've got a paramagnetic source, all you've got to do is to put your hands into it and you get the dowsing response. If it's a diamagnetic field, you no good putting your hands in, you have to take the body forward until your head is in, and then you get a response. To the practical biolocator, it's fairly easy to distinguish the two forms of magnetism. The one which we tend to use most frequently, of course, is the paramagnetic field, because the magnetic field of every material is special to that material. Copper has its own magnetic field, iron has its own magnetic field, glucose in the body has its own magnetic field, and so on. And by using biolocation techniques, it's possible to analyze a material using the magnetic fields. When we come on to Comet Ison, you will see that we've analyzed Comet Ison by using the different magnetic fields. We can identify the water in it, the granite, the oxygen, the nitrogen and uh, so on by using the different magnetic uh, fields. Once we had that theoretical base then it was possible to move forward with biolocation and with colleagues uh, such as Nigel Hughes and the other members of the group we moved into archaeology we were able to do an enormous amount on archaeology and produce a quarter of a million worth treatise on it and we were able to produce a book giving the whole scientific background of biolocation and the experiments that actually prove the reality of the different forms of magnetism and then we found ourselves not looking down into the ground at our archaeological past but looking up into the uh, cosmos and looking at perhaps where one day uh, humanity will actually land up. Um, I'm Nigel Hughes, co-author of uh, a book, The Secret of the Stones, um, Gate to a Lost World, with uh, Geoffrey Crockford. And I'm a biolocator, which means that uh, we use science-based dowsing uh, to analyse uh, magnetic fields. This research has been going on for, for quite a while, since 1995. Uh, it culminated uh, with two books, The Secret of the Stones and Phoenix Point, and advancing the knowledge of science-based housing considerably uh, and its application as a, an analytical uh, process. Two years ago, July 2011, during the course of our work, uh, we encountered a, a natural phenomenon uh, of what we call magnetic holograms. They're a little bit difficult to understand, but they, they're pretty straightforward once you've used our techniques. These are created uh, naturally. Uh, we have been able to sort of harness that uh, process to generate them under sort of controlled conditions and we were doing that on, uh, in a terrestrial situation but in that July we suddenly realised that, the long story, we were looking at uh, holograms, uh, extraterrestrial craft. 
that were naturally being transmitted down from space, as well as uh, light reaching the surface of the Earth from the planets, magnetic fields do, and in our second book we, we describe how we analyse the fields from planets, um, a sort of astronomical form of science-based housing by location, and as a result of that July we suddenly realised that we were also looking at uh, craft, uh, the extraterrestrial uh, technology that's sort of out there. I first met Jeff uh, quite some time ago when I went to a lecture in St Albans uh, on dowsing because I was always interested in it. I could do it but I never really knew what I was doing and I always say that when within five minutes of Jeff giving the lecture I thought thank goodness uh, someone knows what they're talking about. So basically we then started applying all our research to this situation that we found ourselves in July. We challenged ourselves with scientists these were holograms of extraterrestrial craft. We had the, uh, the sort of blueprints of the technology. And of course, we actually could sort of find them in the craft as well. Since then, we've been developing techniques more and more of uh, Comet ISA. Um, I had a look at this with our techniques and found I could pick up the Comet. So I rang Jeff and Gordon, uh, put some emails out. Uh, Jeff's able to do the analysis here during the day. And it's, uh, it's bringing up, you know, just some incredible data and uh, information about what's going on out there, which is, seems beyond the reach of our uh, technology to see. Even if they could see it, I don't think they don't understand what's actually going on.